Hey. Kaladin Stormblast really is the main character of the Stormlight Archive. He's the star of the first book, and his story sets the tone for what the rest of the series is going to be like. We base every new story that comes with each character kind of off what was set up with Kaladin. We know we're going to get kind of an exploration of their backstory and understand how these characters have gotten to where they are, whether they're kind of finished developing like Delinar kind of is, or they are still in the middle of their main development like Shallan. Now, Kaladin's a pretty mixed bag of development. When the series starts off, he's already been on a roller coaster of events that for most fantasy series would be enough for one character's development. He's kind of risen to the top. But this book, The Way of Kings, has enough events for Kaladin just inside of it to really progress him to a whole nother level. So we kind of pick up in the middle of development and then finish off and the flashbacks give us a good grounding of how he got to where he is. I'm going to go through all of these events in chronological order because kind of trying to do the flashback order would be super confusing for the narrative I'm going for here. So starting with the very beginning for Kaladin, he's just the son of a surgeon in a town. Now, this is a kind of unique start for a fantasy character. He's certainly not a farmer or a blacksmith, but he is an apprentice who doesn't necessarily want to end up in the job that his father does or the master he's working for. His dad wants him to be a surgeon and Kaladin wants to go be a warrior. Some things happen and there's a lot of resentment between his father and the town over a debate about some money. There's a lord who kind of has it out for Kaladin's dad and eventually as kind of a way for the lord to get at Kaladin's family, Kaladin's little brother is drafted to go fight in war. Kaladin feels the responsibility to also enlist and make sure his brother is not killed. He joins up with the military and immediately excels as a soldier. He is amazing on the battlefield and this might partially be due to the fact that he's kind of trained as a surgeon and certainly knows where to hurt people, but it's mainly just Kaladin's natural instincts as a warrior shining. I kind of picture him as like Brad Pitt in Troy. <laughs> And this is before his huge arc later on. He's just a naturally gifted soldier. Unfortunately though, even though he's so great as a warrior, he cannot succeed at protecting his brother. His brother dies in combat and Kaladin feels an immense responsibility for this because he promised his parents that he would watch out for them, which he has now failed at. Kaladin continues fighting in the battlefield in a much more haze-like state, kind of just trying to protect new recruits who remind him of his brother and leading one of the most effective groups of soldiers in the entire war. Him and his men are known for just kind of being an unstoppable force, especially with Kaladin as their spearhead. He even manages to find a shard bearer on a battlefield and kill him himself, which is an amazing feat for someone without shard plate or a shard blade to do, but Kaladin is able to successfully take him down. And it's not just shard plate or a shard blade. This guy has both and Kaladin kills him. But after seeing these weapons so efficiently kill the men that Kaladin has come to love, he refuses it and says, no, I don't want these murder weapons to be a part of my identity. I don't want them with me. They're essentially not even weapons, they're just murder tools. They just slice through soldiers with no honor. The general in charge of Kaladin's army, though, sees this as a problem because he thinks eventually Kaladin's going to change his mind and want the armor and blade back. So his logical conclusion is, well, I'm going to wear it then and I'm going to make sure you never want it back. So Amaram, the general of Kaladin's army, slaughters all of Kaladin's men and sends Kaladin into slavery, seeing that as a mercy over killing him. This is where we in the book pick up with Kaladin. He is a broken man who's lost his brother, his men, and pretty much all of his honor, it feels like, and it's just kind of a husk in this slave caravan. While Kaladin is in this slave caravan, there is a wind spren, spren being these kind of fairy-like creatures that embody different aspects of our world that are sentient and kind of really just strange little things, uh, begins speaking to him, an incredibly rare occurrence, and Kaladin eventually acknowledges its existence and kind of has a back and forth with it, and it 
it's revealed that its name is Syl. Syl is uh, wonderful and arguably worth her own character examination. I'm a very big fan of Syl and especially the way her and Kaladin interact, uh, but we're going to focus back up here on Kaladin. Eventually, they arrive to Sadius's war camp. In Sadius's war camp, Kaladin gets the worst job he could possibly receive, and that is to be a bridge bearer or someone who basically carries these massive bridges the army runs across to get across these chasms because they're fighting on like these broken plains with chasms in between. And him and the men will set the bridges over the chasms and be shot at with arrows wearing no armor the whole time. It's kind of the most dangerous job in all of war in this world. He begins to have the first kind of inkling of some kind of purpose. He looks around and he just feels like he should do something. He ends up going on a bridge run and people die all around him. He sees how much of an inhumane thing it is to give someone this job to carry bridges and just run into a battlefield with no protection. It's absolutely terrifying. No civilized army should do that to any form of man or woman, uh, but this is just common practice for Sadius's war camp. Also a very good indication of the kind of person Sadius is. Calvin kind of reaches an all-time low after experiencing bridge runs and goes to commit suicide and there is one guy who's kind of in charge of all the bridges that Kaladin's had a negative relationship with and this guy sees Kaladin going off to kill himself and just doesn't really care. Kaladin gets to a chasm about to throw himself in and Syl, the little wind sprint, convinces him not to. It's a very beautiful moment where she's able to stop him from killing himself and then Kaladin kind of realizes, you know what, no, I'm going to make the best of my situation and I'm going to make Bridge 4 the most badass bridge in all of the army. And he goes back and he takes charge of the men by literally beating them into submission and basically says, we're going to start a workout routine, we're going to get in shape, and we're going to be the fastest, best bridge out on the plateau and we're going to develop ways to keep us alive longer. The men, of course, resist him at first, but he gets a few volunteers and they actually kind of become this brotherhood of Bridge 4, which... Creating real brotherhood in a fantasy book is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Creating any kind of real feeling of a, a group that has a relationship, a bond, is a difficult thing to do as an author, and I think Bridge 4 is one of the all-time best examples of it done well. It is such an awesome thing that is built in this world, and it makes all the stakes feel so much higher, because even if you don't know every member of Bridge 4, when one of them dies, you just, you feel it, and it hurts. You love them, even though you really have no connection with them besides the relationship they have with each other. More and more, Kaladin is progressing progressing as a leader and becoming someone that among the entire army people are revering for taking this group of slaves and turning them into a well-trained, well-organized unit. There are rumors and whispers about him as he becomes someone that anyone can idealize and look up to, which of course makes the person in charge of the bridges resent him. But at this point, Kaladin's actually kind of beaten that guy into submission too and giving him a portion of his pay so that he will actually kind of help Bridge Four do what they need to do. All of this training kind of comes to a climax when Kaladin comes up with the idea for Bridge Four to do these zigzag patterns with the bridge facing the arrows as they run towards the chasms, protecting themselves. They execute this maneuver and the arrows don't really kill anyone in Bridge Four, but Without them targeting the bridges, the archers begin targeting the army, and other bridges try to duplicate what Bridge 4 is doing and fail, and no other bridges really successfully make it to the chasms during this battle, and the entire battle is lost because Bridge 4 broke tradition and ruined the orders that Sadius gave. Everyone's in huge trouble, of course, and Kaladin takes the brunt of it. Kaladin's sentence from the higher-ups in this army for basically screwing up this entire battle with his risky maneuver is to be tied outside during a high storm. This is essentially a death sentence, but the whole thing behind it is if God wants you to live, he'll let you live and you'll be fine. But it's basically a death sentence. It would kill anyone. It's like being tied outside during Hurricane Katrina. Kaladin is left outside, and this is where his power really comes to be seen to the reader. He is able to absorb energy from the high storm and the gems that the high storm kind of infuses with its energy to heal himself. So after the high storm is over, Kaladin's storm blessed has become his final form, I guess is the way I'm going to put that. It's now revealed that he has special powers. 
powers that he wants to keep secret. So now he has gone from being someone who is idolized among the army to a mythical figure of, oh my God, this guy survived a high storm. So this is actually a place I want to take a moment to talk about Kaladin's development so far. We got a man at the beginning of the book who was broken, and it's slowly explained to us why he is so broken. But where he is at right now is kind of the accumulation of him rebuilding his hope. We saw him kind of take the first steps with Syl carry him a little bit towards actually leading Bridge 4, but now he doesn't really need that crutch anymore. He's able to come into his own and kind of take back the mantle that he knows he deserves. Of course, the military can't punish him any further because he survived his supposed serious punishment, so now he's back to running with Bridge 4. And Bridge 4, in general, is doing a lot more bridge runs at this point. It's kind of they're being abused a little bit. Now, all of this buildup for Kaladin's redemption really comes to a head with the very end of the book where Kaladin is with Sadius' army pulling out of a battlefield and Kaladin and Bridge 4 witness that Sadius is leaving Delinar's army for dead. And Delinar and his family and all of his men will be massacred by the Parshendi. Having no love or attachment for Delinar or his camp, Del Kaladin still decides to turn around and give them an escape route, which they successfully do, and Kaladin saves thousands of men and Dalinar and his son by going back and refusing to let uh, an injustice like this happen. Because of his amazing uh, service to Delinar's army here, Kaladin is bought from Sadius's army by Delinar for the price of a shard blade, which is an incredible price for Delinar to pay, and all of his men, and they are made into Delinar's personal guard. This is the pinnacle of Kaladin's racism towards light-eyed people really coming to a head, because yes, he is very much so a prejudiced person, but it's kind of understandable with how many light-eyed people have screwed him over throughout his life. But this challenges his preconception that all light-eyed people are pretty much scumbags bags when Delinar gives up arguably his most prized possession, aside from his son, to buy him and make sure that Sadius will not punish him or his men for their service. It's a wonderful arc, and it kind of comes full circle in a beautiful way. The way Brandon structures his books with the slowly unveiling his character's past as the present unfolds, instead of just kind of coming full circle, that kind of meets in this nice middle where it just kind of links up perfectly, and as the reader, it's oh so satisfying if you look at all the connections that have been made. Everything served a purpose, it did a great job completing Kaladin's original ring of development. He does continue to develop in the next two books, but not nearly as substantially. He more just has conflicts challenging where he has gotten, trying to learn to let go of anger and hatred and coming to really like and understand some light-eyed people. There's also a plot to kill the king that really shows that no, he can't stand for injustice, even if he really believes it'll be for the greater good. Kaladin can't be that cold-hearted. And while he is this kind of desensitized, murdering soldier, he still has his moral code, and he's not exactly 100% jaded. And what we end up with is a character who feels incredibly human because he's flawed. He does kill and he's still filled with rage and anger towards a lot of people from his past, but he's able to let go of some of it and work towards what he knows to be the just path. He's a man who's not about the greater good. He's a man who's about justice. So that is my character analysis of Kaladin Stormblessed, arguably one of the best modern fantasy characters of all time, an absolute joy to follow. I hope you guys have liked this video. Video. Uh, if you want to go ahead and support the channel, go ahead and hit that Patreon down below. If you want to watch with an ad blocker guilt-free, just give me a dollar. That's the equivalent of watching like a thousand of my videos with ads on, so I'd prefer you do that. But go ahead and hit that like button, subscribe if you enjoy my content. Let me know who, what character I should try to examine next. I'm going to be building an established schedule of videos soon, which I'm very excited for. It'll be like Monday review, Tuesday character examination, Wednesday spoiler talk or something like that. I'll get it out there and I'll let you guys know and I'll do that in my Twitter. So if you want to follow me on my Twitter, hit that Twitter down below. Go ahead and follow me there. If you want to follow me on Instagram and see just how boring my life is, you can do that as well. I had a really good time doing this examination. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it. Peace.